Chris Wood. I am from Bale, building a local economy. Um, we are collaborating on this series with the Vermont Health <coughs> Soils Coalition, which is Cat is one of the one of the the founder of um, one of I'm one of the founders of Bale too. There's a lot of people involved in that too. <laughs> um, and uh, I. I just quickly, some of you uh, weren't here two weeks ago. This is part two of a six-part, amazing six-part series. Um, uh, we've been doing this series in Randolph for five years. We've been calling it the Building Resilient Community Series. <clears throat> and this is the first year that we've um, sort of really stuck on one topic, which is a crucial topic that Probably five years ago, I wouldn't even have thought, you know, this is, this is sort of a central issue to be covering in depth. Um, I'm not going to say much more other than <coughs> speak a little off topic. Um, I've been reading... Um, uh, Post, Post Carbon Institute, Richard Heinberg, and he recently put out a piece um, called The House is on Fire. And I decided more and more um, that my job, at least for a very short time, is to remind people that we're, we're in a lot of pain. Um, and it's important to see and feel that pain. Um, and then move through that. And that's, you know, actually the Soil Series is about moving through that. But um, maybe, you know, could we maybe just take a few seconds just to sort of sit with that, um, just be quiet for a little while. I appreciate you all being here. Um, I appreciate my co-coordinator uh, on this very much. Um, I know there's a lot of wonderful and dear people here, um, but right now I'm going to hand it over to Kat. Thank you, dear. So hi, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Um, my name is Kat Buxton, and I am co-founder of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, as Chris said. I wear a lot of hats in the Upper Valley, and I think I know some of you through various hats. Um, I have a few things I want to remind you of. Join the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition if you haven't yet. Uh, we have a very active very active email list um, that you can choose a digest version by the way if you don't like getting so many um, but it's it's super awesome and it's free uh, so join us that's how we're keeping some of these conversations going um, we have a raffle here you all got a raffle ticket when you came in the door if you didn't make sure you get one if you want one the raffle is going to be drawn on April 24th, which is our last event here at Bethany Church for the Soil Series. Uh, the prize is seven books from four women authors, all of which are featured in the Soil Series, three from Vermont and one from New Hampshire. And they've all donated their books as a part of uh, a thank you for coming to the series. We're also trying to raise money to help pay for the series. Uh, so if you want to buy extra raffle tickets, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, they're five bucks each if you want to buy them. Okay, so this is the second of six soil series. Uh, the first one was uh, Ground to Body, a little bit more about the human health connection to soil. Tonight we're going to hear from Lisa McCrory, Tatiana Schreiber, uh, and I'm going to stand in for Graham Unangst Rufina, I'm sorry if you came here just to see Graham, because he's not going to be here. He got knee surgery today. 
So, uh, yeah, he couldn't come. <laughs> but he sent me his slides, and I will try my best to be as beautifully articulate as he is. Um, next week, so for the next two weeks, we have more of these coming up. Um, March 27th is building, the, oh, no, next week, er, sorry, is the storytelling panel, uh, Connection Through Story. I'm really excited about that one. And then the following week is Building Soil from the Ground Up. If you want to know all of them, you can get one of these over at the table. You can also go on our website and get all of this information. It's on Facebook, et cetera. Um, and so we've got this little slideshow up to help thank all of our sponsors. Um, I did get a grant from the New England Grassroots Environmental Fund to pay me a tiny stipend to put this series on for you. Our speakers are all donating their time, but we are gonna try to come up with a little bit of money to help pay them for their time because we really appreciate their skills. But we also got generous support from NOFA Vermont, Upper Valley Food Co-op, Gardener Supply Garden Centers, Soil for Climate, Vermont Compost Company, UVM Center for Sustainable Agriculture, Clean Yield Assets Management, Rural Vermont, Cedar Circle Farm, 350 Vermont, Vermont Land Trust, Community Resilience Organizations, Longwind Farm, Community Resilience Organization of Hartford, Two Rivers Ottaquiche Regional Commission, Orca Media, who's here filming tonight, Earthwise Farm and Forest, Sewing Peace Farm, the Center for Transformational Practice, Myco Evolve, Voices of Water for Climate, and Bale and Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. Um, so I just want to say, <laughs> yes, thanks. And, and, and thanks to all of them. Um, when, when Chris asked me to do this series, I, I stalled for a little bit. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then I just took off, right? So I came up with a list of ideas for a series, and then I started thinking about who I might want to speak for those series. And I sent out one email to 19 of the busiest people in the state, and almost every single one of them said yes within like 24 hours. And then I sent out a request for sponsorship to all of those organizations I just listed off, and they all got back to me right away saying they were very interested in sponsoring, and some people actually sought us out because this is such a cool thing. So we are still looking for sponsors. We would love to be able to pay people for what they're worth. Um, so uh, if you have any ideas of sponsors, please let me know, and I, I will reach out to them. So um, without, oh, with one more thing, I want to thank Black Crim. How was that food? <laughs> Um, we are paying Black Crim for their work, but they are giving us a really deep discount. They are amazing. And they're an example of why we all want to be here. This is a family that runs a farm that brings local food to restaurants. They, they're, they're all about building a local economy and having healthy soil. And we need them. And they need us. So I'm really glad that they were a part of this. Um, if you want to get the notes from this event, we are taking notes. The last one yielded eight pages of notes and resources. Um, and we also are filming the event, so if you want to get a link to that film afterwards, make sure you sign up on the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition email list. That is not putting you on the listserv. That's putting you on an email where I will then invite you to sign yourself up for the listserv. So if you want to get the notes, Sign up there. If you're already on the listserv, you can get them that way. Um, and we want to know what you think of these series, so please give us feedback. I think I would like to invite Tatiana. Tatiana comes to us from Southern Vermont, and she was one of the first people that really excited me that came to the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. She's got a wealth of knowledge, and so here you are. I'm going to set your slides up. Okay. I was thinking I have a place I could put this down. Oh, you can put that here. Yeah. 
Okay. Can people hear me? Okay. A little bit. I think we probably want to okay. darken, darken this side of it. What do you guys think? It's sort of yeah. a yeah. It's sort of a trade off. Yeah. Then you don't get to see her very much speaking. It's the I don't. Well, we'll look at it really well. Let's let's. Yeah, right. You don't need to see me. Okay. Oh, but I need to see this. We're just going to do this arrow. Okay. Let's see if that's. Okay. All right. So just um, just to say a couple words about me. So you know where I'm coming from. I um, yeah, I live in Westminster West. I think you um, want to hold that as close to you as you can. Can everybody hear me? Okay. If I pull it closer, my closer. Yeah. That's better. That's better. Yes. Okay. So I live in Westminster West, um, down south, and um, have a little farmstead there where I sell seedlings. I also um, teach at King State College uh, in environmental studies and uh, work for Rich Earth Institute in Brattleboro, which is working on the recycling of urine, uh, human urine to use as a fertilizer. Are you having trouble hearing me? A little bit, Okay, yeah. sorry, I'll try to be. Okay, so that's a little background. You gotta hold the thing. Okay, <laughs> all, right. Um, all right, so I, um, our topic was shielding soil with plants and animals, and I decided I wanted to focus on trees because um, I feel like we, in Vermont, we just um, sort of take trees a little bit for granted because we have quite a few trees here, but, um, but uh, when we talk about the importance of um, bi biodiversity, I just feel like trees are, it, especially in farming and gardening, we sort of um, don't necessarily give trees all the credit they deserve. So I decided to focus on that. Um, so that's what I'm going to do, and then hopefully Lisa and Graham will talk a little bit more about ways we can use trees, but I want to talk about why trees are important um, to soil and everything else. So but first I wanted to just say a few um, key concepts. One is that um, climate change um, is a <coughs> symptom of something larger. So climate change or global weirding, as many of us call it, is the problem itself. But I think of it more as the symptom of a larger problem, which is the disruption of our ecosystems and ecosystem functions. Um, because intact or integrated ecosystems are complex, carefully integrated and calibrated systems that play multiple roles in enabling energy flows, um, water cycling, nutrient cycling, and maintenance of the atmospheric conditions that have been our sweet spot for so long, and that's now changing. Um, so excess emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases is a symptom also, and we should reduce you know, these emissions as fast as we can, but that's not gonna be enough to restore our climate unless we also stop disrupting the um, <coughs> The, the damage that we've done um, and undoing it. And a huge problem is that, I think, and I've uh, also been very influenced by Dan Young. I don't know if Dan is here, but who's on the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition listserv. I've learned a lot from him. And one of the things that he's um, influenced me to think about is that a huge problem is just the loss of biomass in general, how much biomass we've extracted from the environment. Um, because it's in biomass, in living plants, animals, and microorganisms that, um, that stores and circulates not only carbon, but a, a range of nutrients that all of us, all organisms, need to survive. And also, um, biodiversity is key, not just biomass, but biodiversity, because each organism plays its own role um, and has its own niche, as you all know, I'm sure. Um, but so the more diversity we have, the more species there are to play these roles, and the more resilience we'll have should you know, any particular species or organism not be able to survive um, whatever happens. So it's the complexity and structure of these systems that um, I think in the long run will reverse the ecological disorder that we find ourselves in. Um, so let me go back here. Um, so it's, what is the best way to do this in Vermont is what I want to focus on. So I come to this from um, the lens of agroecology. Everybody comes from a different, a different point of view, but my perspective is agroecology. Um, I did graduate work for my doctoral degree, which is in environmental anthropology in Mexico, and was influenced by um, people who have worked in Latin America on agroecological thinking. 
Um, it's an idea that's been around for actually a very long time. But um, <clears throat> so some agroecological principles that I think are important, and some of these come from a lot of the thinkers in the field of agroecology, like Stephen Gleisman, who's now retired from um, UC Santa Clara, Santa Cruz rather. But these are some principles that are we can use. One is an ecosystem approach that um, farms and gardens uh, should be used from a biological or ecosystemic perspective rather than an industrial model of production and efficiency. Um, the farm doesn't end at the edge of a field. Instead, it exists within a broader ecosystem um, or watershed or bioregion. Um, two is biomimicry. You know, we should, we should think of production strategies which mimic nature's own diversity. Um, three, polycultures. Agroecology stresses polycultural strategies over monocultures as a way to foster diversity within any farming system. Um, multiple systems, agroecology emphasizes the idea that agro or agriculture is embedded in biophysical, social, political, economic, and cultural situation, so you can't really just think about what plants do I need to plant. You have to think about all these other factors um, that will affect whether or how we're going to be able to do what we want to do on our farms or our gardens. Um, local knowledge, um, agroecology, now that's funny, why is that other slide? Oh, no. That's just on here. Oh, he's showing me the next yeah, showing slide? showing you the next oh, cool. slide. I didn't even realize that was happening. Okay, um, local ecology. I mean, local knowledge. Um, Agroecology uh, values the preservation of local knowledge over the imposition of universal methods or methodologies. That is, you know, people, you all know your own landscape and ecology best. And so there isn't just one way of doing things. Um, and I think that's just really important. Whatever we decide, you know, is the way to move forward. There are many other ways, and we have to be open to that. Um, so d that includes cultural diversity um, and different ways of knowing and understanding the world. So like I tend to use a sort of a scientific, somewhat scientific way of understanding the world, but other people don't. And I think we need to learn how to cr uh, talk across those differences. And then uh, local self-management. Agroecology favors local self-management um, of the natural conditions of production and promotes uh, local control over political and economic institutions. So again, um, agroecological agro thought suggests that people need to be in control of how they carry out their work. But this is something that um, I think when we get to the discussion at the end, uh, this may instigate some t thinking because um, the idea of local control when we're talking about a collective good, like what we need to do about climate change, these things come into conflict a lot and um, so we need to think about um, about that how we're going to achieve collective good while also respecting people's uh, local control so um, what role do trees play in all this trees and shrubs um, so this is a giant ash in Westminster or Putney and some of us who admire it so you can see how huge it is um, so trees play a huge role in our life. Um, Vermont lies within a deciduous temperate forest biome. Um, and so whatever we do, we want to try to mimic um, the environment, a deciduous temperate forest in our own environments. So, and I'm probably going to say, you know, things that, um, that you all know, but, or you know a lot about trees, probably a lot of you. But one thing I wanted to do tonight was just to tell you some things that maybe you can use when you go out to talk to other people, some things that will help you when you want to advocate for why it's important to keep trees and shrubs and other perennial plants in our environment. Um, so deciduous forest has high canopy, a sub canopy, a shrub layer, an herb layer. Many of you who are interested in permaculture you know, will know all that. Um, but one thing that's interesting is the standing biomass in a deciduous forest can be up to 40 tons per acre. And a 30, 30 to 40% of that is in the roots. Um, a deciduous forest has slow decomposition due to cool, shaded soil 
and uh, also the high tannin in the leaves. And um, it has high organic matter near the surface because of the leaves, and it has uh, a lot of roots, as I mentioned before, but the fine fiber soil in the roots holds the soil, soil stable and retains nutrients. And also a forest, as you know, has great vertical and spatial diversity, which provides a lot of habitat for various species. So we can learn a lot from our own forest, but we can also learn from other forests or places where um, forests are, such as um, the apple forest in Kazakhstan. I don't know if all of you know that our apples came from Kazakhstan. That's where the wild apples live, and there's the greatest diversity of um, of apple cultivars is in these wild apple forests in Kazakhstan. Um, and also uh, places like Mexico, like I said, where I did my graduate school research. This is just um, an image from above because I had the chance to fly over um, and see the forest from above. So just looking at the forest, you can see the diversity of it just by looking at the, the different leaves and the different colors. And this is the Lacandon jungle in south southeastern Chiapas. It's a naturally diverse rainforest, and it, it has some 4,000 plant species, including 57 different orchids and dozens of species of hummingbirds. So um, again, it's just, so this isn't coffee and cacao. I worked with coffee and cacao farmers there, but, and this isn't coffee or cacao plantations, but those coffee and cacao of uh, farms that are very diverse have almost as much diversity in them as an intact rainforest. And we can do the same thing. Um, so that's where I was inspired by this kind of thing. Um, so what role do trees play? Um, so I'm just going <coughs> to give you some, some juicy details about trees. Uh, <laughs> Um, they can dramatically affect the ecosystems of which they're part. Below ground, trees affect um, so soil structure, nutrient cycling, soil moisture. So a rule of thumb I came across is that the, um, in Arborist News, um, is that the ratio of uh, root radius to trunk diameter, can anybody guess? <laughs> What did someone say? She said times one, I said more than that. Ten yeah. one? More. 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 <laughs> Forty. Twenty? More. One hundred. No. <laughs> Less. <laughs> this is a rule of thumb, but it, the rule of thumb is thirty-eight. It, it depends a lot on the tree, of course. And and they can go and of course they can go depth much, much deeper as well. Uh, this is just the sort of radius. Um, and these roots interact with microbes um, in the, the rhizosphere, in the area around the roots is the richest area of diversity. It's considered one of the most complex ecosystems on earth. It has in it, you know, bacteria, fungi, oomycetes, ne nematodes, protozoa, algae, viruses, archaea, and arthropods, which I'm sure you're going to learn all about more in another session. Um, but those are all involved in the complex interplay with plants. Um, oops, I'm supposed to be here. Oops, wait a minute. Okay. Um, above ground trees alter the light environment, uh, which affects humidity and evapotranspiration. Um, branches and leaves provide habitat for animals, and birds, and insects, and modify the effects of wind. Um, regarding insects, some interesting facts. Um, Hundreds of insects are associated with each tree. For example, I could do another one. Um, how many insect species do you think are associated with oak trees? <laughs> Any ideas? What? 100. 300. 300. <laughs> 300. <laughs> About 300. That was a good guess. Um, that's just oak trees. Um, the greater the diversity of trees, the more diversity of insects. Um, I just also just read an article by uh, Henry Homeyer, garden writer in today's uh, Brattleboro Reformer. Um, he quoted Dan Jaffe and Jane Brown, who, in, in, who said that 500 species of butterflies and moths are supported by five native tree families, oaks, cherries, willows, birch, and poplar, and 400 just on cherries alone. 
So like choke cherries, wild cherries, um, support all those, um, all of those uh, moths and butterflies. And is, is this in any environment they are? I mean, well, the more diverse the environment is, the more like habitat they're going to have. If there's just one single tree, there probably might be less because they don't have that other places to live and reproduce. But um, but the bigger the tree, the more insects there will be on it. Um, okay, I got to move along here. Um, the leaves fall and provide soil cover and affect the soil environment. Um, the leaves decay and become a source of organic matter, which in turn feeds microbial diversity. Um, and then the trees affect the surrounding agroecosystem, again, limiting water and uh, wind and water erosion. And as you all know, with climate change, we're going to get, we are getting heavier precipitation. Um, trees can also temper the, um, the impact of, of heavy rain events by slowing the velocity of the rain. They provide shade and browse for animals, and they form these mycorrhizal associations. Um, fungi consume about 30, per, well, you, another thing a lot of you probably know, but fungi, so the plants produce sugars, and fungi consume about 30% of the sugars that the plants produce, uh, for, that they photosynthesize from sunlight. So, and the sugar fuels the fungi as they scavenge the soil for nutrients and then they feed those nutrients to the trees. Um, so the system, you know, again, supports nutrient cycling and also sequesters carbon. And another thing I learned from Daniel Young in his book, um, Restoring Climate Stability by Managing Ecological Disorder, he writes that fungal hyphae may contain more organic carbon than all other soil life combined. So that was interesting. And uh, Walter Jenny, uh, who's an Australian microbiologist, says, he says there are 35,000 kilometers of fungal hyphae per one cubic meter of healthy soil. Um, and I don't know if we have time or if this would work if I clicked on that. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> that, little, that little video, it was just a one minute thing, I'm not going to do it, but it's um, this um, person who wrote the book, The Hidden Life of Trees, who talks about how trees communicate, you know, also through their, um, through these fungal associations and also through other um, chemical messages that they have. Um, and leguminous uh, trees contribute nitrogen to the system through nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So there are, there are legume trees like honey locust, for example, um, and trees, um, reduce water losses through evaporation. I mean, that's not right. Trees reduce water losses from the plants around them. The plants around them that would uh, lose water through evapotranspiration, the trees can protect that and prevent some of those losses. Um, but they can also reduce, trees can also reduce excess water through hydraulic lift. What is that? And um, <laughs> I'll explain that in a sec. Um, <laughs> Um, well, through their roots, pulling up water from deeply down below, um, they can... A mature tree can lift 100 to 200 gallons of water out of the ground per day and discharge it into the air uh, in a day. That comes from uh, North Carolina State University, but another um, ecologist I just talked to said that during the growing season, a tree can, um, can draw up to 400 gallons a day during the growing season. And they can share that water with plants around them. Um, so they act as irrigation for surrounding plants so they can make agroecosystems more resilient to droughts than floods. And according to a Czech botanist, Jan Pokorny, whose little article you will see in Jan Lambert's book, that's on the book raffle, <laughs> Water, Land, and Climate. He says, during a 10-hour period, a tree cools its environment with a seven kilowatt power output. <laughs> um, and water vapor rising from trees also travels into the surrounding region, um, condensing in cooler places, and then releasing heat there. So overall, you know, trees and forests play a key role in moderating climate extremes. So if we keep enough trees 
in the landscape, in agricultural landscapes, we can mimic this role of natural forest systems. So, you know, what I'm really arguing is that, um, you know, when we farm and garden, we tend to want to have sunlight so we can have maximum yield of our crops. But um, I think we really have to think two or three times before we cut down trees to get more light because of all these reasons that trees are so important. With regard to carbon sequestration, a tree can absorb as much as 48 pounds of carbon dioxide per year and can sequester one ton of carbon dioxide by the time it reaches 40 years old. And New England forests are particularly important with regard to carbon sequestration because the rest of the United States has lost so much more forest than we have. Um, so in terms of climate change, we really need to think you know, a lot about this. Um, of course, you need to think about the balance of sun and shade and other potential negative influences of trees, for example. But, so there are negative influences like it might change the microclimate and you might have higher humidity, so you might have more insect and pest issues, which you can control by pruning or by the way you space the trees or by the species you choose. But for example, one study in Mexico with trees growing in and around a cornfield found that the soil conditions were consistently improved by the presence of trees. Um, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus content of the soil was higher. Um, there was higher soil pH, um, increased moisture content, and lower soil temperatures um, in that area around the tree. So the corn yield directly below the canopy was lower, but corn in partially shaded areas and within the zone of the root influence produced just as well as the corn um, growing in the open. So that shows that it's not the, it's just the shade that affected the yield, not any kind of competition for nutrients. So we also tend to think of trees as, oh, they're gonna compete for nutrients, but um, that wasn't the case in that situation. So um, we, also, we often hear that Vermont and New England are a success story because we had so much deforestation and now it's all grown back. Uh, but some of you may have heard about this um, recent study that, um, from the Harvard Forest. I don't know if any, has anybody heard of this? It's a, a study that came out uh, last year. What wildlands and woodlands, farmlands and communities broadening the vision for New England. And it's um, a study that found that we're now in a second phase of forest losses since the 1800s. All, of, all six states of New England are losing forest. Um, at a pretty substantial rate. So, okay, I have to stop, almost to the end. Um, so, anyway, um, so I hope, you know, Lisa and Graham, I, I, I just telling you about trees. Lisa and, and Graham's talk will tell you more about how we can use trees in our landscapes. And um, just my own work lately is um, working with solar agricultural dual use, trying to think of <coughs> solar panels as a type of tree and what plants we can grow around them. And that's just a picture of me um, growing plants, currents around uh, solar panels. But um, we can talk more during the discussion. I think um, did you want, I think what we're going to do is so um, I should have told you already how the evening's going to go. We have three presenters. Um, we may shave Graham's presentation since he's not here. Um, and we have 20 minutes left to do two. Um, then for the second half, what I'd like to do is make you all get in a circle. And then we have a discussion. Because we're a large group, it can be challenging to have a discussion. So what we did last time is we went around the room and you get to ask a question or make a statement. So I want you to, uh, to prepare yourself already that you may not get your question answered, but this is the start of making connections with each other. We are building the social mycelium. There's only so much we can do in an hour and a half. 
Uh, so we wanted to make sure to deliver information and then get a chance to hear your voices because we have three people up here giving presentations, but I can guarantee you that the expertise in this room is amazing. And I want you all to know who's here before you leave. So with that, I'm gonna invite Lisa to come on up and tell us about her work. There we go, that's better. Um, kiss the mic. I'm gonna go back and forth, putting my glasses on so I can see you and taking them off so I can see this. So, bifocals, all right. Hecklers, I will deal with you afterwards. She's my favorite heckler. So, I loved hearing about trees, that was amazing. Such great information. And what I wanna focus on with my talk is the farm as an organism and how on our farm we have, uh, are working to develop a relationship with the farm so that we are part of it from the roots to the sky. And we grow a lot of different, uh, we have, our crops are per primarily perennial crops with about an acre of of annuals that come in to play as vegetables or flowers. But most of the crops that we have go from perennial uh, landscape of our apple trees or other fruit trees to blueberries to edible bushes to then um, diverse pastures for our livestock. And we have a lot of woodland where we, we manage that ecologically. Uh, my husband's in charge of that part. And we also do some sugaring. So my presentation is going to hopefully give you a flash of that. But I also want to make sure that we don't lose sight of, and I'm sure that'll be in the talk too, about our connection to the next generation or the next generations and looking way into the future. Um, call out to a great um, activity that's going to be happening on Friday for climate awareness. But a little bit about our farm. Um, Earthwise Farm and Forest, we're located in Bethel, Vermont. And prior to farming with my husband, I've got a background in organic farming, education, grazing management. I was, I guess you could call me, I was an extension agent of sorts before I became a full-time farmer. And I find uh, full-time farming was kind of where I needed to go. I really burned out of being the resource person going place to place when all I wanted to do was do it myself. And the relationship that I've gotten from the land and with my family has, has been so satisfying. And hopefully, you know, as, as a lot of people in here are gardeners and farmers themselves, you'll, some of what I'm going to be sharing will hopefully resonate with you. So our farm is a certified organic homestead farm. We use draft animals. and. Motive power, we use draft animals for motive power, but also we have our, our animals are harvesting most of the feed themselves. We try to avoid using fossil fuel driven machinery as much as we can. Um, using biodynamic principles, uh, regenerative principles, as, as well as organic ecological principles. So the emphasis of our farming enterprise is to develop a functional relationship with the land base looking at our farm as more of a living, breathing organism. We market a lot of products on our farm. We like to be diversified in the things that we grow and the way that it allows us to interact with our land. So from doing raw milk to uh, organic meats, vegetables, uh, eggs, maple syrup, flowers, added products. But another thing that I think is a really important part of our farm is the education that we provide, whether we consult off the farm or we bring people to our farm to live, to, to work 
with us to learn about certain concepts or topics, it, it's a great way to raise awareness and to have good heartfelt discussion uh, all, along a lot of different paths. So from teaching classes on making uh, value added uh, with cheese, butter, and yogurt to anybody aspiring to have a family cow, learning more about uh, the spiritual component to living with the land and learning how to douse and use that in your agricultural pursuits, management intensive grazing for people wanting to incorporate livestock into their, uh, into their farm projects, or just the basis of, of starting a homestead farm. So our primary goal for having our homestead farm is to grow most of our own food rely on our many livestock enterprises to build soil and to manage our nutrients. Again, to manage our gardens with minimal disturbance, using raised beds, mulch, and sod in between the beds. Um, using our lifestyle as a form of our, our health care. And raising our children in an environment where they can also develop skills, awareness, and hopefully uh, continue with our enterprises that we've got in place or to branch out and do something else that, that they're um, interested in doing. As you can see from a, here's a map of our farm. We have a, our house is up here, but you can see that there is a lot of splatterings of open land, but a lot of wooded land. So we take advantage of this landscape with the, the wooded areas around our open areas for windbreaks, for um, water conservation. The, the blue lines there, we have a lot of passive energy as part of our, part of our um, farm system where we capture water and it gravity feeds to all the different pastures. Our grazing system, as I might have mentioned, is an intensive rotational grazing system, and that in itself is a great way of building, uh, story, capturing carbon, building uh, diverse pastures, and, and also be, being able to provide our livestock with the highest quality feed. Now a little bit about our home itself, which was very much an intentional design of uh, an octagonal log house with about an acre of land around it, which has about half of our garden usage. A lot of sloping land, like I said, so there's a lot of terrace beds, a greenhouse, uh, some pastures for our poultry, but when we built this house, it was mostly wooded areas that we had to build up again with our management. So with our rotational grazing systems, we've turned what was very, uh, marginal soil to very healthy, robust pasture surrounding all our various little gardens that we maintain through rotational grazing with our poultry, for example. Our larger animals go to the further pastures. We also have a lot of um, energy conservation uh, technologies to go along with our, our farm, which I think is part and parcel to this whole intentional design of having a, a homestead farm. So this octagonal log house is, is off the grid. Um, all the wood built, that built the house came from the land, came from our property. We have a system where we capture the water off our roof and that water then travels to the gardens that are on our property. We've also got some solar panels here on the outside that we use to heat our water. And then in the wintertime, we have wood stoves with copper piping inside the wood stoves to then heat our water for winter use. The water that feeds our house is located at a higher elevation from the house so that, again, it, it gravity feeds to the house so we don't need, the amount of energy that we need for our household is about, um, let's see, about 20, 15 to 20% of what a household of four or five people would, all, would need. So if that makes sense, the amount of energy we need on a daily basis is way less than, than what the typical household would use, partly because of 
the solar energy, but a lot because of the, the passive energy that, that is in the system that we've got. So we're really conscious about, we also have composting toilets. So we're taking responsibility for every part of the system on our farm, and that's really satisfying. And it, it makes us much more, much more aware of where things are coming from and where they're going. This is just a picture of, so we capture the water off the roof and that travels to uh, a tote that is right next to our greenhouse, but we could also divert it to containers at all the other gardens so that we don't need to tap from our well. We've got that water readily available for, for our gardens. And this is a picture of the landscape around our house. You can see most of this was very, was forest soil beforehand, but through Literally, through our rotational grazing system, we've built grass. And that, that forage will, there's a portable hoop house or structure right there that has some of our birds in it. And they're moved once or twice a day onto fresh grass. And they're leaving nutrients behind, doing a quick harvest, and then moving on. And, and that's building um, quite a feed system for those livestock. And again, some more rotational grazing. When we get to some of the further larger fields, we've got a rotational system where our meat birds and our cows can alternate and rotate and, and graze uh, one after the other. Again, this kind of a system, with adequate wet rest and recovery, we're building soil, we're building organic matter, we're increasing the amount of feed available for our livestock over time. This, this land is becoming more and more productive all the time. So a great way of using our livestock in uh, building our soils. Whether we've got our cows, our meat birds, or our, our laying, laying hens, they're all out harvesting feed on their own. And when it comes to pasture reclamation, we've got some pretty tired areas of land that need some attention and some extra fertility. We have our, our pigs come into play there by, uh, they're our rotivators. So they'll turn over the soil, <coughs> clean it up for us, so that we could then um, spread some annual seed and let that, let that forage come back into place and we can throw that into our grazing rotation with our, with our cows and our horses. Can I just ask you, when did you start out farming? Oh, I'm sorry. We, uh, our Earthwise Farm, we started farming, our farm, Earthwise Farm and Forest, started in 2003. But I've been farming for probably 25 years, and then my husband has been on the property where Earthwise Farm exists. He's a third generation on that farm in Bethel. My husband is a forester and, uh, and a logger, an ecological, Forester, I suppose. So this is just a picture of again, you know, the pigs come in, they'll they'll open up a or turn over a pasture, we'll come back through and we'll seed it down. It shoots back up and we start um, we'll bring our animals in when the pasture's ready to be grazed for, for the next time through. And this turn something into a mar what was marginal land into something that become, can become much more healthy and much more productive over time. Now, with our design, with our small pastures of like anywhere from two to four acres in size, they're surrounded by a lot of trees and brush, and that becomes a critical part of, of our system. The browse, for example, is something that our cows love to eat. It's an, it's an important part of their diet. It also provides shade for the animals at um, different times of the season. That can be really important. And it also provides a windbreak and a protection for, for the animals at certain times of the year. Because we're gonna continue using our land in the wintertime as well, giving them fresh air, access to the outdoors. We're gonna, uh, we winter our animals outside, meaning that they're outside 24 hours a day. The only time that we would make an exception to that is if the weather gets really bad, really, you know, really windy, really wet. Otherwise, they've got a lot of the protection from, from the trees, from certain canopies. And by having them 
moving around on, on some of those pastures that are in need, they can add a lot more fertility to that land, making it even more productive and increasing the biological activity in that soil as a result. So whether we're feeding them with a round bale feeder or just putting um, roots hay out in select areas, come springtime, those pastures in need, those pieces of land in need, are going to have a nice healthy swath of manure and, and leftover hay, chaff, etc. And all of that is rife with life in biology and it's feeding the soil. And that piece of land, for example, that um, in the spring, it took a little while for the forage to start growing through, but when it did, this piece of the pasture is two times more productive than the adjacent field as a result of that heavy dose of, of biology and organic matter. And actually, seed from the dry hay that the animals were being fed, we're almost we're reseeding the pastures at the same time. Close up. <laughs> Now another part of our farm is, is being active, having a voice, and talking about what's important to us and what's making a difference. So through our involvement with rural Vermont and, and other, um, this was a picture from the day that the GMO labeling bill was signed and put into action. I think we lasted three weeks. <laughs> but still, we did it, you know? We got on the map and just showed what a, what a lot of grassroots organizing can do. But this is a real important part of, of developing roots and connecting to, you know, getting passionate about what's important to us and, and, and instilling that passion into the next generation, into our kids, which is the next part of my slides is when we started farming together, my husband and I, we chose to homeschool our kids, which we did for the first, I don't know, seven or eight years of their education, which gave them all a, a strong sense of work ethic, drive, interest, self-interest of what, what really inspires them. Each kid is obviously unique and has their own strong interests, but they're all in the public, or they all ended up going into the public school system eventually. But I feel like that seed start at the beginning really made a difference. And, and they come back and they, they have these skills that they just take for granted. But then you, know, you interact with some of their friends and it's just surprising what their friends don't know that my kids just know because they've just been doing it all the time. So it's a really important thing for us. And another great reason why we like to have educational workshops on our farm, because we can have great discussions about how to share information with one another or to inspire people to do something that they are interested in by seeing something in a, by example or just by getting stimulated by meeting other people that come to the farm and having conversation in the midst of a workshop. So seeds are getting planted all the time. So my son Timber, who's now 16, has, has got a real penchant for, you know, his name is Timber and he is probably destined to becoming a forester as well, which is <laughs> nice. Um, but here he is learning how to train our, our little team of bull calves. <laughs> and this picture is uh, my daughter, Thule, and a friend of ours weeding a garlic bed. And it's kind of a dark picture, but there's Timber working, working his steer. And he's now, like I said, 16. And the steer that he's working there is about 2,000 pounds and five years old. Uh, this is my last slide, but I guess the ultimate message that I wanted to bring across as we talk about shielding the soil with plants and animals is how it's not just the plant. I, I'm, I'm one of the animals <laughs> that's working on this farm. And it's the relationship that we're developing with the plants and the animals that we're raising on our farm and how they, they work together and how we learn about ourselves in the process of, of growing healthy, vibrant food. And 
I came across this Farmer's Creed when I was at a rural Vermont event a couple years ago, and it really stirred me to the core. And it might be a little bit hard to read, so I just want to read it to you. And this is the outcome of, of uh, why we farm. I believe a woman or man's greatest possession is his or her dignity, and that no calling bestows this more abundantly than farming. I believe hard work and honest sweat are the building blocks of a person's character. I believe that farming, despite its hardships and disappointments, is the most honest and honorable way a, far a woman or man can stand his or her days on this earth. I believe farming nurtures the close family ties that make life rich in ways money can't buy. I believe my children are learning values that will last a lifetime and can be learned in no other way. I believe farming provides education for life and that no other occupation teaches so much about birth, growth, and maturity in such a variety of ways. I believe many of the best things in life are indeed free. The splendor of a sunrise, the rapture of wide open spaces, the exhilarating sight of your land greening each spring. I believe true happiness comes from watching your crops ripen in the field, your children grow tall in the sun, your whole family, the pride that springs from their shared experience. I believe that by my toil, I am giving more to the world than I am taking from it, an honor that does not come to all men or women. I believe my life will be measured ultimately by what I have done for my fellow man and woman, and by this standard, I fear no judgment. I believe that when a man or woman grows old and sums up his or her days, they should be able to stand tall and feel pride in the life that they have lived. I believe in farming because it makes all of this possible. Awesome. So. Thanks, Lisa. How are y'all doing? Good. It's eight o'clock. Um, so, you know, Graham prepared some slides for us that I, I just want to take us through a few of them because he's he wanted to bring some um, pieces to the discussion that I don't think we've covered yet. Um, I also want to take a moment to let you know that there are two boards up on the wall for upcoming events and groups, uh, and I want to make sure that you all get a chance to write down upcoming events or groups that you're associated with that you want everyone to know about, because they'll go out in the notes. Again, those connections that we have among each other are the way that we can build the social mycelium to hold our communities together while we learn to build the soil that literally holds our communities together. Um, so uh, Graham Unex Tarufanat not only has a great name, um, he works for Rural Vermont. He is a beef farmer, Robinson Hill Beef. Um, he studies uh, agroecology. Uh, permaculture and uh, can he can um, remember the most amazing facts he's one of those people um, so one of the things I know that Graham wanted to talk about is um, Lisa Lisa started saying it by you are one of the animals on your farm you know we are a part of this ecosystem we're not apart from it and Thinking in whole farm terms or in whole landscape terms or whole community or whole earth or whole systems is what we need to, to, to do as a society if we have any hope to, to shifting the paradigm. And, and a lot of that means listening also. Um, and I want to just point out that this Friday is a youth action day where youth from all around the world are striking because we're not doing enough to create a livable future for them. This really is an emergency. This isn't just a joke. <laughs> um, and the young people are scared. I mean, why wouldn't they be? It's hard enough to be a teenager, never mind being connected to everything all around the world all the time, getting all the news, the same news we're getting and ignoring, maybe not the people in this room, but 
Um, so this Friday, uh, all over the state of Vermont, there are actions. I know there's something going on at the State House. Um, and I really think it's time that we begin to act more. And I know Graham is a big uh, proponent of that. So one of the things he wanted to think about is where are we? You know, where are we? Who are we? Um, if we think about where we are, this is, this is our home, but it may not be recognizable to, uh, to us because it doesn't have the normal colonialist lines and names and all of that, but if you look for that lake that we all know what that looks like, you can find where we are on this map. And this is reminding us that we're on stolen land. Um, we all are, we're here. Um, I think it's important for us to remember that and to begin to try and engage in a way forward that doesn't look so much like us just operating on stolen land separate from a lot of other people. Um, and so another thing you want to think about is knowing your biome. Where are we? This I thought was a really great thing that Bram, Graham brought forward. What is your zone? What grows here? And not only that, but what did your zone used to be? And where is it now? So this is just a difference between 90 and 06. In the last 12 years, we've seen a, another difference. And um, we need to plan for that. So when you're thinking about your 15 year farm plan, and I gotta say, I'm so inspired to know that those slides that we saw from Lisa, I, I, it's Carl is third generation, but we're looking at 15 years of solid work and 15 years goes by pretty darn quick. So that to me gives me a sense of hope and possibility. Um, what is the history of Vermont in terms of plants and animals and soil? These are questions that are important for us to be asking. I'm just gonna kind of fly through these because we're running short on time. Um, what is the primary animal we're talking to about functionally integrating into ecosystems, <laughs> right? We're the problem. <laughs> Nobody else is seeming to struggle with making room for everybody and keeping things biodiverse. Um, you know, next week we're gonna have a storytelling panel and I just have to share one little tidbit with you. One thing that's come out of that group is the, the similarity between the words humus, hubris, humans, humor, humility, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, I'm gonna get to these slides. Graham has some amazing pictures here, so just to leave you inspired. Um, there are so many ways to do things, and there are so many ways to do things in a way that we're not disturbing every system around us. Um, Tatiana mentioned in her slides this idea of eco-mimicry and biomimicry as being a foundational piece of agroecology. This is a very old tradition. This is just about us looking at nature, looking at the world around us, and mimicking the brilliance that we see everywhere. So when we think about soil health, and we think about the billions and billions and billions of microorganisms <coughs> in the soil that are self-organizing and self-intelligent, selectively intelligent, what can we learn from that? Can we learn to collaborate on that sort of level? Can we learn to mimic some of the systems that we see in nature to produce food and livelihoods for ourselves? Um, this is just an example, um, Jay Fortier's uh, farm in Quebec where he's seriously using every piece of that land for production um, and leaving a healthy ecosystem behind him. <coughs> Here's an example of cover cropping on a home garden. And what I also see in this picture is, can you imagine a big rainstorm, right? And what part of that soil would be held and what part wouldn't afterwards? And so we're looking at the roots to hold our landscapes together. Here's an inspiring shot. <laughs> Um, I think Graham is trying to show us the kinds of management that we're looking at now. This is a lot of what we see. But could we start to move toward more integrated systems of management where we're starting to use some of those examples of biomimicry, ecomimicry, things happening all around us. So, you know, biomimicry, I think about 
um, that we designed Velcro from Burdock, right? That's a pretty simple one, or the duck wing airplane. Ecosystem mimicry is looking at that whole burdock plant and the system that it grows within. We're looking at the whole duck. So we're so parts oriented. We're very reductionist humans. Um, and, and that could be very useful when we're trying to learn about the details. But uh, panning out to the bigger picture often gets lost. This is this might just look like a pile of weeds. Does anybody know what we're looking at here? Comfrey. What about this style of planting? Do you know what? Permaculture. Permaculture. Yep, a fruit tree guild. This is a fruit tree guild. Um, so there, there's so much going on in this picture. It's a multifunctional stacked system. Um, so there's a lot to learn in terms of these sorts of ideas of stacking functions, which is a lot of what we saw happening on Lisa's farm and a lot of the systems that we heard Tatiana talk about that trees do, tree stack functions nature stacks functions. That's an inspiring picture. How to hold the hillside together. Humans had some involvement in that, but you know they, they looked for ideas in nature. Um, this is Eric Tonesmeyer's farm in Holyoke, Mass. So that's a half acre yard. Used to be grass. Ben Fox Place in Vermont, digging his own ponds. He reports that after Hurricane Irene, he didn't have any flooding because he managed his landscape well and planned it. There's a fruit tree guild by design. Now we're getting into alley cropping. So this is where you're using the space between fruit trees to also grow more plants, uh, either for human consumption or ecological services of some kind. Mob grazing. You can do it with anybody. <laughs> cows, you can see where they were, or where they are now, and where they're going next, just 24 hours later. This is silvopasture. So this is the idea of using forests to help raise animals, but it's really more about taking a field and planting trees, you know? So I don't want to advocate, and, and nor do the people who design these practices want to advocate for cutting down a forest to replace it with farmland? It's more about integrating those systems and stacking them. Lisa talked about the tree being shade for the cow, in the, and that's so important. So when we allow animals to have a natural ecosystem, with, when they get to decide what they're eating, they also like to eat lots of woody stuff. Um, there's a way to integrate this um, animals and live, or livestock and plants, so plants and animals can provide a lot of, that's another inspiring picture of a uh, silk pasture. And those trees are crops, for one thing or another. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna leave it at that, and we have 20 minutes. So I'm gonna propose you want to do a circle? No. I was, well, how about a show of hands? All right, so I'm gonna give you two options. One is that we get into a circle and we pass around this little mic, not this one, I have to record this one, and everybody gets to ask, a, you say who you are, what drew you here, and either ask a question that you're, that, like you just can't wait to find the answer out to, but you're not gonna get it, or a statement, like wh what are you feeling now? And that way we can sort of get to know each other before we all part. The other option is that we stay in this arrangement and do a standard Q&A with our speakers. But my fear there is that people will get left out. One thing we could do is just have everybody get up who's able to stand for the 20 minutes and just get to the side of the room and look at each other instead of doing the whole chairs thing. And then that would open up time and we could have people speak up who wanted to, but we could see each other. No. I don't know why that sounded so complicated. Because <laughs> I don't think it was. No, it was simpler, I thought. Yeah, so you're saying get in a circle, but no chairs. So yeah. let's do that. Um, we're, we're, oh, no, wait, wait. I was going to give you a choice. All right, raise your hand if you want to do a circle. Oh, come on. Circles are great. 
Okay, hands down. Raise your hands if you don't want to do a circle, you want to stay in this arrangement for standard Q&A. Boring Q&A. <laughs> Wants to be Wait a second. <laughs> no judgment. <laughs> I don't think it really. Uh... Uh... <laughs> All right. No buzz. Yeah, let's. Let's get that circle. means you get to choose. I guess I get to choose. Yeah, you guys are really indecisive. <laughs> um, Let's, people are leaving, so let's stay right where we are, and um, I, I still would like to pass the mic. I want to know who's here, and with, with people taking off, you have a chance of maybe getting your questions answered. Can you hear me? And can you hear me in the back of the room? So I, I, I'd like everybody to just look up here for a moment. Do you see how I'm holding this mic? That's really important. If I hold it out here, it doesn't really work. I know I'm loud, but not everyone here is. So you want to just kind of almost touch your lips. And if you don't do that when it's your turn, I'm going to remind you. Uh, I think we opted out of the circle because uh, I don't know why. Um, I would like to, to pass the mic. And I would like everybody to take a chance to say something. If you have a question that you want to make sure gets answered, just be clear about that. But please tell us who you are, why you're here. And keep it short, because we want to give everybody a chance. If you don't want to talk, that's OK. Just pass. Mark Kelly, Mark Kelly from East Randolph. And uh, I don't have a question right now, but um, I'm here because of an interest in the soil and what's going to happen on our farmers field. I'm Joseph Carruthers from East Randolph, and I am, uh, uh, I'm, as a result of tonight, I'm really interested in how I could integrate, or we could integrate, trees and shrubs uh, and uh, approach our farm in a different way. I'm Cynthia Jackson. I'm here because this is just all so important, and I'm lapping it up. <laughs> Thank you. Great. I live in Randolph. Um, Ronnie, I'm close. Wondering Put it right close how to your Randolph there. is going to be dealing with the emerald ash borer, the ashes that are around uh, in uh, in town and also in our forest, <coughs> and what is the plan? Can I have it for a second? I forgot one thing. Oh. I forgot one thing I was going to say at the end of my talk. I was going to raise some questions for discussion. One was um, sort of, again, how we, how we balance uh, collective concern for um, everything we need to do to mitigate against climate change or become more resilient in our individual concerns. And the other one was just, how can we help each other? Like if somebody wants to integrate more trees and shrubs into their landscape, what do we need to do to make it more possible for people to do that? Not just homeowners, but, but farmers, because it, it, you know, it needs support. It needs support if people are going to be able to do it. So. I'm too busy typing. All th this is the amazing note taker. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize in advance if I'm butcher anything that was said tonight. Um, I'm Lauren Can't Weston. Hear you. Oh, sorry. I'm Lauren Weston. I'm from uh, Richmond, and I just like being here. <laughs> <laughs> just really jazzed about fungus and mycelia now. Every time I hear more about it, it's just so amazing, and I want desperately to get that um, more integrated in my growing system. John Pemmental from East Randolph, uh, interested in soil health and building resiliency in our community and our uh, soils. Yosko Pimentel from East Randolph, and um, this is all exciting learning experience. and. Uh, I would really love to use this knowledge. Laurel Stevenson from Portland, Vermont. I moved up here because I, my immune system went 
berserk and I needed the healthy air and I couldn't use any outside inputs on my um, little two and a half acres uh, where I was raising food. So um, I've been making humanure since 2013. <laughs> Woo! Bravo. I'm, I'm Abby Miling and I'm from Randolph Center and I'm here because because this is important, and I'm, I want to learn how to do the um, the fruit tree. I forgot what it's Guild. called. Guild. Guild. I really want to learn about that. I'm Camden Walters from Randolph Center. I have a little homestead up there. Um, I guess one of the reasons I came was because we're, we two are going to be buying and starting a community orchard up at the interstate, and the soil's really poor. And so I'm just interested in you know how to work with regenerating that soil, all different you know techniques and whatnot. So, um, just tap it. Ditto what Camden said, and um, if anyone in Randolph or the Randolph area is interested in getting involved with the community orchard, you could check out RandolphCommunityOrchard.org. Uh, Tim O'Dell, and I'm interested in some work that uh, Tatiana just uh, briefly hit on, work in um, uh, with um, co-production on solar fields. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I'm contributing right now to an enhanced energy plan for my town, uh, I would like to find out what the parameters are, if, if they're available for um, building a solar field so that it can, it can, ses can successfully co-produce Okay, and I'm on VHSC. You may recognize my name, and I'll be happy oh, to right, give you that that overview. Okay. Thank you. I'm Nancy Wither from um, <coughs> Falls area, and I would really like more time for us to talk in small groups about what we're doing and how to integrate some of these things. And I'm getting frustrated because we can't. Connect enough. Yeah. Um, I'm Carl Tiedemann, uh, co-founder of Soil for Climate. Uh, and if any of you are interested in following this conversation at a global scale, I encourage you to join our Facebook group. We have over 10,000 members from more than 100 countries around the world. Soil for Climate. Mm -hmm. I'm David from John Randolph. And I guess I need a little dose of hope, and I'm here. I just want to hear about all the great things that are happening. I'm Lucy Gamble. I'm coming from Lyme, New Hampshire, and feeling pretty inspired about how much community there is around this and how many people came out tonight. I'm Katie Allen. I'm also from Lyme, New Hampshire, currently living in White River Junction. And I'm here because I cannot shake my sense of responsibility to the planet. And, um, the future generations, and uh, I decided I don't want to shake it because living purposefully is more fun and um, brings me to life. And I've had the privilege of learning the importance of food and farming and sustainable agriculture. And uh, yeah, it's it's brought me to realize this is the way. This is what we need to all be learning about. And I love building community around that. So. And I'm thinking of um, continuing with a project in Lyme, New Hampshire to teach children basically a farm to school summer camp in Lyme. So I'm just throwing that out there in case there's connections to be made. Thank you. I'm Molly Wills. I work for rural Vermont in Montpelier. And I'm here because I'm inspired by healthy soils every single day and the ones that tend to them. I'm Mayan Kasimov. I live in Montpelier. I'm not sure what this lovely lady just said really resonates and, and hits hard. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out what is my role and how I can contribute to this great effort we all need to put forward. Hi, I'm Amanda Garland. Um, I'm the Natural Resources and Sustainability Instructor in Barrie at the Central Mount Career Center. And so I get to teach high school students mostly solutions-based um, teaching and a lot of hands-on projects around sustainability. It's wonderful. If any of those high school students show up on Friday, they're going to get a big fat zero. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. 
Hi, I'm Paige Greenfield from White River Junction. Uh, I just wanted to say that there is a workshop on the Emerald Ash for next month, the Vermont Forestry, I don't know what the, their official name is, they're from the state, are doing a presentation for our region on Emerald Ash for planning um, for towns. Do you know where it is? I don't know, I'm sorry. Oh, it's actually, um, it's at the Bay, Baird Hall. It's, it's about 20 minutes away from here. Barrett. Barrett Hall. Oh, it's Barrett. 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 South Stratford. Let me <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. Um, I'm Zoe Marco. I'm from, uh, I grew up in Rochester and I live in Bethel and Burlington right now. Um, I have been interested in permaculture and soil building and worked on a variety of homesteads in basically every climate imaginable, um, particularly the desert since uh, 2012, I think, is around when I started to get interested in that. Um, and right now I'm sort of trying to figure out how I can uh, put the things that I feel passionate about into practice while I don't own land or really live on land. Um, I'm just figuring that out. I'm Sylvie Devis Valley, I live in Tunbridge. I've been, I was born and raised on a dairy farm in Franklin County and I've been growing a lot of my own food for quite some time. Um, and more recently, I'm really interested, I think what's going on in Vermont and around the area with uh, local foods is really great, but I think we, I'm really interested in um, how we can start growing our own clothing. Yes. Um, yeah, plastics, you know, and all that in, in clothing and, and like why, you know, all the hemp that we're growing, can we, you know, start growing hemp for, for clothing as well as wool, which is my all time favorite fabric. So I'm really interested in seeing how, you know, how that can start happening around. Hi, Tammy Jo, and I'm here because I feel like a seedling and all this, and I really want to learn and find out where my place is here, what function I can um, do, whatever. So anyway, thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Bednar. I live in uh, South Royalton. And i um, here to, one, learn a little bit more about um, where some of my food comes from. So uh, thanks for your amazing farm stand. Um, raw milk and meat and everything up there is amazing. So it was really cool. I didn't know that was what I would learn tonight, but I'm really excited that I did. Um, and new to Vermont, so um, this is the fun of being here, I guess, is being able to um, get down into the soil. And I'm unexperienced but do have some land so I'm looking for resources and people with skills and experience that are interested in collaborating in um, in projects um, uh, in sustainability and permaculture and um, all sorts of other fun buzzwords like that. Um, my name is Elena Greenlee and I'm living in South Wales in Vermont. Um, on land that my grandparents lived on for about 50 plus years. Um, but I grew up in New York City and did not learn the skills that Lisa's children learned. Um, and I couldn't agree more about how essential those are to life. And um, I'm uh, living with Tony on this land and we're just really trying to learn our place and how, um, how we can offer the land as a healing um, sanctuary for all kinds of beings, um, including humans um, and otherwise and always looking for people who have skills and knowledge and um, good energy to collaborate with. And thank you all. Um, and I had a question for Tatiana about why we're losing forests um, in Vermont, if, if we know. I just, I mean, it's, it's um, a lot of it's fragmentation just for how, you know, development, housing development. It's not, it's not so much forestry practices. It's, it's the land that we're losing from development and, um, yeah, and you know, malls and parking lots and all that sort of thing. My name is Kai Cochran. I live in West Hartford on a small farm. And I think that this is the most important topic for humans at this time. And I think that uh, events that Bale puts on and that Cat organizes are the best way to learn more about it. <laughs> 
CSC farm for an organization called Life Lab, and um, which deals with bringing, in, like getting children to use, you know, a, a, the garden as a classroom. And um, I'm hoping to work with the Heartland Elementary School and getting their garden uh, more uh, an integral part of their school. Uh, I live at Cobb Hill. It's a 270-acre farm, and we're about to really dig into putting a bigger solar array so i'm also interested in you know how to make that complement the farm and more permaculture practices there as well so lots of things buzzing <laughs> thank you uh, my name is keith walsh i live in fifth foot center vermont uh, i feel blessed to be in a room full of people that are taking this stuff really seriously and very very excited for what's going to happen in vermont with uh, all of this knowledge coming around My name is Jael Polskamp. Um, I'm a farmer in Worcester, Vermont. I um, actually studied indigenous agriculture in Panama 20-something years ago. Um, I work for 350 Vermont. I'm on the steering committee for the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. Um, and yes, there's the Youth Climate March, which my 13-year-old daughter will be in on Friday. Um, the next steps. <coughs> oh, next steps. Thanks. <laughs> the whole reason I'm here. No. <laughs> um, 350 Vermont is doing a five-day walk from Middlebury to Montpelier, April 5th through the 9th, um, with the big action in Montpelier. There will be several actions. We're walking along the pipeline route and then um, in, into Richmond and stopping at solutions-oriented stops, so along the way, like farms and composting operations. Um, but I, my secret mission in life is to destroy industrial agriculture. <laughs> my name is Jesse Markson. Uh, I'm also a recent transplant. I'm a mycologist and permaculturalist, at least by interest. And I'm going into my first season as a gourmet mushroom farmer, looking to integrate it with uh, micro livestock and perennial agriculture. And I'm here because what better place to learn and connect to beautiful community. Sandy Andresa Cooch from Braintree, grateful to be here for all the reasons. My, uh, I guess if I had to do it over again, I'd be an entomologist, is that the right word? Mm -hmm. I'm into the bugs and doing things like that. Yeah. Yeah, we have some closing remarks, but so um, it's 8.30, and I want to honor, I think it was you that You're said, not on. You're not on. oh, I'm not loud enough? <laughs> <laughs> never happens. <laughs> um, so I want to honor your suggestion that we need more time for these discussions, and I agree. Um, and I am so pleased that we've had such a good turnout here. We kept these short because it's hard to get people's interest. Um, I run land listener workshops with the Soil Carbon Coalition. They're three days long. Um, and it's hard to get people to sign up, but that's how much time you need to really learn a lot of this stuff. So we're gonna stay connected there's going to be a lot more happening after this series. The next one is about storytelling. The one after that, we get into geeky soil stuff. You're going to love it. Um, I love it. I'm one of the speakers that night. Um, along with Jess Rubin, who's going to uh, geek out on mushrooms. You're going to love her. Um, and Juan Alves, who is a pasture management specialist at UVM Extension Sustain Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Totally brilliant guy. We're also going to be talking about resilience at a future one. And then our last one, April 24th, is all about water. 
Um, it's all about soil, but we're going to be focusing more on the water aspect. So there'll be bits of information coming from each one of these. We could spend a week on each one. So thank you for your patience. I'm so glad we got to hear from everyone in the room. If you want to keep this discussion going, attend more of these if you can. Join the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition listserv. Choose the digest. <laughs> we don't want to get too many emails. But there are amazing conversations happening there. There's no, there are no bad questions. You can ask a question on that listserv and you will get answers from farmers, scientists, backyard gardeners, teachers, maybe even some kids soon, you know, like we need everybody there. And I work with children a lot and I get some of my greatest ideas from them. Um, I think this was mentioned uh, this Friday. You mentioned it. So this Friday, students are backing up. They're walking out of school. They don't have permission. They're not doing it. They're doing it. I mean, and I know a lot of schools, that even around here, which is, I mean, I haven't seen that many in this immediate neighborhood. But, um, and in Montpelier, they're doing, at the State House, starting at 10 o'clock, they're doing a whole bunch of sort of organizing and planning or, you know, around Green New Deal and a, and a variety of other things. But we can join in on that. Um, tied into that, um, Sandy mentioned when she came in, she said that she's probably been to the five years that Brielle has been doing these programs. She says, there's a lot of young people in the room. When we started, there was a lot of gray hairs. Um, and it has been, you know, it's sort of my personal mission. It's like my work in the world is to build a base of transformative leaders. And I always think that, for the most part, they're going to be the young folks. Thanks a lot to all us gray, gray hairs who sort of messed the, you know, messed the planet up. But my heart and my passion are with, you know, that woman who wonderfully spoke about, about where we are right now. The one other thing that happened as I was sitting back there and we were speaking was every um, part of this series for all the, for the past several years, we have done a farmer's dinner. So it's called Know Your Farmer, Feed Your Farmer. We do it here. Black Crim does a whole meal. We sit at tables. It couldn't happen this year. Uh, and then I got two days ago, uh, three days ago, I got a call from the Vermont Law School. Um, it's, uh, they have an organization there, student organization, called the Food and Ag Law Society. Young students passionate about exactly this field. They said, we want to do a Know Your Farmer, Feed Your Farmer. And so it is scheduled. So if you're a farmer, you don't have to be a farmer, but farmers are especially welcome on Saturday, March 30th at 6 p.m. It won't be here. It'll be at the Vermont Law School. But the Food and Ag Law Society are going to invite the whole community and all the farmers to come down there um, 6 p.m. on Saturday the 30th. So put that one on your calendar, too. Um, yes, upcoming event. Thank you very much. Um, come back next week. <laughs> <laughs>